Uh, I'm Gen Dr. Jennifer Neville from Royal Holloway University of London, and on behalf of myself um, and my colleague, Dr. Megan Cabell, who you've just heard from, um, from the University of Birmingham, I'd like to welcome you all to today's seminar. Um, and this event comes out of our AHRC project, which is entitled Group Identity and the Early Medieval Riddle Tradition. And the fruits of this project, and there are many, um, they include the Riddle Ages, which is a public facing website, which provides text translations and commentaries on Old English and Latin riddles. It also includes last year's seminar series, which was entitled Early Medieval Identities. And if you missed that, there are recordings of it um, on the website as well. Um, it was very good, I recommend it. Um, you, it also includes some very, very exciting conference papers by Megan and myself. It includes resources for teachers um, wanting to incorporate early medieval riddles into their key stage two curriculum. And face it, who wouldn't want to incorporate early medieval riddles into their key stage two curriculum? Um, it's going to bear two articles, two forthcoming articles about the previously neglected seventh century Latin riddler um, Boniface and his community. And very soon, um, this project is about to bear fruit. Um, Riddle Quest, an escape room located at Sutton Hoo. So watch this space. Um, we're hoping to be able to release news about that very soon. Today, however, um, is the launch of our Riddles in Conversation series. So um, the Exeter book. The Exeter book riddles were left frustratingly, no, no, not frustratingly, delightfully unsolved in their 10th century manuscript. Um, and they're often enlisted to illustrate what we think we know about early medieval culture. But the truth is, and if you've tried reading them before, you'll, you'll know this, the truth is they're really not very good about answering questions about things. They're really good about asking questions about them. So in this seminar series, what we're trying to do is to put the extra book riddles in conversation with different kinds of knowing. So we're going to explore in turn um, poetic translation, visual art, ornithology, and woodcraft. And we're hoping that these four conversations will bring new insights, not only into our favorite texts, um, but also into our understanding of early medieval culture. So it is my very great pleasure now to introduce today's speaker. Um, Judy Kendall is a reader in English and creative writing at the University of Salford. And although she does know her old English riddles, she approaches them not especially, not particularly, or not first as a medieval scholar, but rather as a poet um, and as a collaborative translator. Um, in her other works, she writes poetry. She translates poems from many, many different languages into English, and she writes articles and books on poetics, poetry, visual text, and translation. And we're really looking forward to her forthcoming third monograph, which is entitled Where Language Thickens. What a great title. I wish I'd thought of that. Um, and in it, she's going to be discussing the idea of the inarticulate in language. And that's due out from Edinburgh University Press this year? This year? Maybe next year. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we'll keep... this year. <laughs> okay, hold on. We'll hold on for it. So today, however, she's going to be talking to us about riddles and avant-garde translation techniques. Um, we're going to let Judy um, have her say for, I don't know, about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, Judy? Yeah. And then we'll have about 15, 20 minutes at the end for questions. So as, as um, Megan suggested, please make note of them and keep hold of them until the end. Um, and Judy, the floor is yours. Thank you. So first of all, I need to share my screen, um, which hopefully is going to work. So can you all see the slides? Well, maybe don't all shout at once, but yes. Yes. yes, yes, we can. Okay. So great. The, these slides are uh, as much a prompt for me as anything, but hopefully they'll help as I talk through what I'm going to do. So first of all, I thought I'd put up the full title of um, where I'm coming from so you get an idea of what I'm trying to do. But um, even before that, I really want to thank Jenny and Megan for letting me hold the floor and think about one of my favourite subjects. It's, it's so great to, it's such a luxury for me to be able to go into this. So I'm interested in applying avant-garde translation techniques to the Exeter riddles and what these reveal about, um, about my own translation processes, my own approach to poetry, and possibly also to the riddles as well. 
and um, whoops. Um, I, I also want to make clear that I'm not an early medieval scholar in any shape or form. As um, Jenny has said, um, I, I teach English and particularly creative writing at Salford. I write poetry, I make visual text, I'm interested in poetics, I write critical papers about this. I collaborate translation in, on translations from languages I know, but also from languages I don't know. And one of those languages is Old English, so I want to make that very clear at the start. Um, so that's partly why I'm so excited to be in this conversation, because I'm, I'm absolutely happy if people correct me and tell me that I've gone wrong or, or inform me of um, aspects of the subject that we're talking about that I didn't know. This is, this is what conversation is all about. So you might think, why translate from a language you don't know? And how can you do that? It's actually very common for poet translators to translate from languages they don't know. And in that case, very often they'll collaborate with the original poet or a first language speaker. Of course, you can't do that with the riddles. Um, so then maybe with a scholar, with dictionaries, with grammars, with previous translators and previous translations. And that's how you get around not knowing the language. Why would you want to do that is also a good question to ask. And for me, I'm primarily, I'm just interested in this experiment of rendering one text from one language in another language. And I find that that process of translation brings me nearer to the original source, to the text that I'm translating. It illuminates it in a creative way and also critically. And my experience of translating is as important or perhaps more important in many ways than the final product. I feel like I somehow touch that poem closer, touch the language, touch the culture it comes from closer by that very intense forensic series of forensic acts that translation often is. So it's a very indulgent process for me. I'm going to use a few terms um, as I talk about um, this subject, and they're fairly self-evident, but I'm just gonna run through them here for you in case you're not familiar with them. Domestication versus foreignization is something that you'll probably come across, or you used to anyway, in any translation conference that you might go to, perhaps not so much these days. But domestication is very much what it says on the tin. When you translate a poem, so that it's domesticated in the language into which it's translated. This means it's a very smooth text that you wouldn't necessarily know was a translation at all if you weren't told. And foreignization is the opposite, where it's very clear, perhaps from the language of the poem, that it's not from that culture or that language that it's been translated. I'm interested in avant-garde techniques and avant-garde really means any technique of translation in this case that is not currently considered as mainstream or conventional. And I emphasize that word currently because it can change really quickly. What is weird today can be totally accepted tomorrow. But I'm interested in different ways of translating that really push our understanding of what a translation can be. And also because of their unusual approaches can really illuminate the original texts. I'm also interested in the threshold of the articulate and the monograph I'm working on at the moment is very much about that, about the moment where language becomes in, inarticulate or breaks down and self-evidently, obviously, even courageously breaks down to show us what language cannot do. It's a very honest way of working, I think, and it's something that um, I like to see being brought into translation. Okay, so domestication, I said, was where you have a smooth text in the, what's called the target language, the language that you're translating with. So if it would be modern, modern English if I'm translating from Old English to Modern English. Modern English is the target language. There's little trace of the original language. Very often the translator is not named. These days that's less unusual, but in the past very common not to name the translator. Limited awareness of the original context or society from which that text came or its provenance. And quite often in the past, no sense that it's a translation at all. So that you're reading a text thinking that this 
translation, translation is the original language. That is a domesticated text in translation terms. Domestication, when it's mixed with early medieval texts, there's extra elements to consider. So a domesticated text, a text that's smoothly translated into the translating language, isn't um, going to convey the fragile material from which you translated, whether, whether it was a photocopy or the original manuscript, there may be parts that are illegible, there may even be parts that are missing. You can imagine a scholar spending ages scrutinizing on a letter for which perhaps we only have part and deciding what that letter might be and therefore deciding what the word that is missing might be and the translator simply translating that word without an indication of all the effort that has gone into reading it and also of all the effort of, and also the assumption that's gone into assuming that this is the word that was meant. Similarly, with early medieval te texts, um, a fragile manuscript might have lost or changed its value over the ages. So whereas initially it might have been used to record in what was considered to be an important or valued text, it might change into material that you're going to use as a chopping board or as a blotter or as a coaster. And the text itself gets forgotten, gets obliterated, gets cut out, even gets burnt in some cases. And again, does the translation um, include that information? Are we aware of that when we read the translation in a domesticated translation? Very likely we won't be. Here's just a couple of pictures of blocks and holes that I found on the internet, a really ginormous hole there and lots of blocks. So that it's just, just to give you that sense of the difficulty of the text that you might be working from, that a domesticated translation will not replicate. Other aspects to consider when you're translating from early medieval texts is that they may well have been and probably were frequently copied. And if a text has been frequently copied, there's likely to have been some inaccuracies, some errors, some changes, even some interpolations into it. It may not be what the original text that it was copied from. It may not be the same. So when we look at these texts, we're dependent on the scribes. We're dependent on their zeal, their enthusiasm, their attention, their knowledge, their interest, how tired they are. And they could easily make mistakes or lack of tiredness. Their opinions and attitudes, if they feel very strongly about the text they're copying, are they going to change something? We're dependent on that. And then there's also to consider the concept of the original text. Very often um, with these medieval texts, you might want to consider that there's an oral provenance. The written version is itself a translation of something that was previously delivered orally. And if it was delivered orally, it's likely to be a piece that changes with each telling. This, this makes us think about the concept of the author, the sing, original single author that we're so used to playing with these days. And perhaps there is no original single named author. And if that's the case, perhaps we can understand why a scribe and a commentator might add or change the text if it's no longer sacrosanct with this sense of one original text or one original author to it. And again, how often are these things considered in domesticated translations? Now, here's an area, this is not really something I know much about, and I know that some of you know a lot more, so do feel free to add and comment at the end. I'd be very happy. But um, we've got this wonderful paper that I really enjoyed reading called The Rhetoric of Commentary, which from which I've just quoted here, that in medieval texts, it's customary to include blocked out columns around the text, enabling and perhaps encouraging commentary, glosses, commentaries upon commentaries, and these would be interwoven in the text among it, through it, so, so that the authority, um, both in the sense of the command that it might have or the single author, resides as much in the marginalia or in those blocked out columns of commentary as it does in the original transcribed words. So again, this is concept of the text as original, having a different meaning if we're looking at these early medieval texts from how we might consider it today. Okay, I'm going to leap from that 
to the words of the anthropologist Clifford Geertz and this wonderful quotation from him that you might know. We have turned out to be rather good at waddling in. In our confusion is our strength. Now Geertz was talking about anthropologists and anthropological study. And he was, in this quotation, he is lauding, praising the way that that study had developed. So that instead of an ethnographer um, walking into a particular society and taking notes on it and then um, extrapolating certain conclusions and presenting a very neatly drawn and logical paper, he, Geertz and his fellows encouraged a very different attitude where all the notes that were taken and that the notes themselves should take as much as possible um, observation of the surroundings and the context are valuable in themselves. That that tendency to neaten things, to streamline them, to, to find answers to particular questions is actually quite dangerous. That neatness is taking the researcher away from the truth um, that they've been observing. Instead, confusion is strength. Confusion is closer to that, to that truth. Waddling in, um, in, a, in a kind of messy way, is much more profitable than trying to find some very neat and concise um, summation of what you're looking at. Okay, so, but Clifford Geertz, of course, was writing about anthropology. However, wonderfully, he compares this to reading a manuscript. And I was so excited when I found this um, wonderful quote from him. He parallels this waddling in to trying to interpret a manuscript. Doing ethnography, he says, is like trying to read in the sense of constructing a reading of a manuscript foreign, faded, full of ellipses, incoherencies, suspicious emendations and tendentious commentaries. All those things that I've just been itemizing that we tend not to take into account in domestic translations. And of course, it won't take you long to work out that I am saying, or I'm going to say, that confusion and waddling in to translation is a much more fruitful, beneficial and truthful and strong way of working with translation. And I'm going to look at some people who do this. The first person I'm going to look at, and these will be quite brief because um, I don't want to take too much time, but the first person I'm going to look at is Bill Griffiths, the scholar poet, Anglo, old English scholar poet. And um, I'm going to show you in a, in a minute an early Welsh text that he translated in which he uses an X to represent uh, what he calls a syntactical link that tends to be equivalent to the English of. And his purpose in doing this is to preserve in his translation of the original Welsh some sense of the pattern of that Welsh, the pattern in, in terms of its syntactical structure, structure. So that's the kind of grammar order of the words. Um, something that he says, and I have no Welsh either early or late, but something that he says is not easy to replicate otherwise in English. And so let's see what he does here. And this is just an extract from what he himself called his technical Welsh English translation of Y Gododin, which I am suggesting is a waddling translation, if you like. I'm not going to read it to you, um, but I think you can easily see as you scan these, these slides that there are plenty of X's there, and those X's, as we said, donate um, an item in Welsh that is sort of equivalent to our of. You can also see there are lots of hyphened words, there are bracketed words, sometimes bracketed and hyphened. There's a question mark, question special drink. And then on the last line at the very end, we've got white bracket equals holy question mark, close bracket hyphen song. And you can imagine that there's a word there that um, contains um, the semantic meaning of white and song. So he's hyphened it, white song. But also there's possibly an allusion to holy, hence the equal sign, hence also the um, question mark and the brackets. And so through that very kind of clunky um, notation that he's given us as his technical translation, we're beginning to learn something about the original Welsh that we wouldn't have if he did indeed find a word that indicated white, holy and song in English that we normally use. 
we wouldn't get this sense so clearly. And that's Griffith's reasoning, which I've itemized here for you. He thinks that this kind of translation is really important. Firstly, he values it because it's rigidly parallel to the Welsh. He recognizes that it's rigid. He also recognizes actually that it's awkward. He makes no apologies for that. He values it because it shows the syntactical structure of the Welsh. And he says a syntactical structure is also showing the way an idea or a thought develops, the order or progression or trajectory of that thought. If we keep that same structure, that same order, we're also going to keep closer to the way the thought or the idea develops in the Welsh. Also, as we've seen with that question mark on, ho on ho question mark holy, um, his translation shows the uncertainties and the range and possible ranges of meanings of the Welsh. Also, it can be amended easily to keep up with current scholarship, he says. And that's really interesting because we don't normally think of translations as something that are open to amendments. But he's saying this is open to amendments. It's not finished, it's not polished. He hasn't spent ages working out the rhythm or the rhyme or the form of the poem. He, you, he would be quite happy to add another equals if he found another word that White could suggest as well as holy to that last line. It wouldn't be a problem. It is open to change, so it's not finished. Instead, um, it points to the original text, and this is the next point, the only version, this is the only translation that enables the reader who is not a Welsh scholar to look through it and understand the original text. It takes you back to the, the source text, the source text being the text that we're translating. There is no, in a way, there is no target text. The target text, as I said, being the kind of translation product. If there is a target text, it's the Welsh. So we start with the Welsh, we go to this technical translation and its final um, um, aim, if you like, is to take us back to the Welsh um, as, a, as a target, it's translating itself almost. And this means that um, it's fascinating, this technical translation of his, because in it, there's a very strong process of the awareness of the process, both of reading it um, as we struggle with these brackets and question marks and equal signs, and also of, that, of the struggle of translating where you've got all these alternatives and you're not even sure if they should be there. That, that process is very much there on the surface. Okay, fascinating, I think, absolutely fascinating approach, I think. I'm going to move on now to um, some more recent translations. And I'm gonna mention Miller Oberman, who is, was in that first series that um, I think Jenny was talking about, and I do, recommend listening to his um, session. I'm gonna quote it actually in this, in a little later in this presentation. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what he talks about there. And, and it's taken me on a little bit of a journey. So I, I recommend listening to it too. Um, so he's written two versions of Wolf and Erdwerker in his um, 200, 2017 poetry collection, Beyond Still Ones. And I'll talk a bit about that. I'm going to look at my own attempt at translating Riddle 7, and I'm going to be quite critical about that, which is fine, fine, because it's my own work. And I'm going to look at John Porter's translation of Riddle 89. Um, all of these, where the process is taking us to a product, product. So first of all, Oberman had two translations in the Unstill One once, and one of them was very conventional. And he acknowledges it as a translation in the book we learn that it's a translation in its subtitle. It is translated from the Old English, very clear. You can't, you can't get around that. Um, absolutely certain that that's a translation. And here is an excerpt from it. Um, you can see the subtitle there. I think it's very beautiful, actually. It's, it's got a really beautiful sense to it, the placement of the, the gaps, the, the, the placement of the gaps between the lines and in the lines, um, the choice of words. I, I, I mean, I, I enjoy it and I'd encourage you to read it, but we'll see what Oberman thought of it later on in a moment. Secondly, although firstly in the book actually, he also included an unorthodox version of Wolf and Erdwacker and he doesn't call this one a translation. He calls, his, the subtitle says it's after the anonymous old English poem of the same title. So it's actually suggesting it's different. It's, it's a poetic 
separate poetic piece that has a link to the old English poem. And later in the same book, in his notes, Oberman refers to it as a reaction, not a translation, to the old English. So very clear. And here is an extract from this, also very beautiful rhythmically. You can see the connection between the two. And I'm going to read this one. And if you if you're not if, if you don't know, again, I encourage you to get the book and read the whole thing. Um, you can see that it's basically um, a series of alternate possibilities for reading a particular word or phrase in the poem. There is either an eagle or a cruelty, or cruelty to the woman who has always seemed inseparable from eagles, or the one who copied her poem suffered from partial blindness and wrote the wrong word entirely. Certainly sharp-edged things, carnage, slaughter. Really brilliant, I think. Right, what's really interesting is the unorthodox version is only identified as a translation in retrospect. At the time of publication, it is clearly not presented as a translation. And even when Oberman describes the moment when he, he realizes it is, that the poem is notes I wrote after two days trying to translate the poem like a real translator. And then I realized that it was my translation. So even at the time of composing, he realizes in that retrospect, but he chooses to present it as not a translation nevertheless, because I presume it's not a real translation. So um, that's an interesting um, comment in itself to consider what does a real translation mean? And um, there is an implication here and in further remarks by Oberman that actually a real translation isn't really a translation at all. So what is notes at the time of writing becomes a translation later and is only publicly declared as a translation four years later um, in the um, Medieval Identity Seminar. And I've um, written down here the words that are recorded and you can hear them um, um, on the website, as Jenny said. So this is what he says. Yeah, I'm gonna say this. The poem in my book that I regret the most is that I included a non-radically literal translation of Wolf and Erdwacker, and I really, I think it's as good as anyone else's, which is to say, it gets it all wrong. And secondly, that the unorthodox version is my translation, which I do feel good about. And then he informs us that this particular translation emerges from a practice of tactical misrecognition in translation. So his initial assessment of the two is completely reversed four years later. And that's why I said avant-garde can perhaps, does not perhaps last very long because certainly in Oberman's head, what he conceives of as translation has switched completely in those four years. So it can too um, for any of us. Let's have a little further dig into this. So tactical misrecognition is the deliberate, radical and acknowledged, and acknowledged is quite an important part of it, departure from familiar conventional translation approaches. And so perhaps we could say that Bill Griffiths is also a tactical misrecognition. Um, certainly it fulfills all of those requirements. And when Oberman talked about it in the seminar, he says that for him, it's an ultra close proximal reading. And so remember what I said at the beginning about how I like to translate because I get very close to the poem. This kind of translation gets you even closer. It's also productive. It can offer us. It's better. It's the most honest translation. It's like honest flat fact, as well as being completely wrong if you judge it in terms of what real translations might be. Okay. So um, I'm just going to um, talk a tiny bit more about Oberman and that first point. Waddling in confusion is staying in the moment. So waddling is that word that we've taken from Clifford Geert's wonderful um, quotes about anthropology and we're applying it to translation is staying in the moment, showing the difficulty, the variety, the possibility, and the confusion closer to the surface. Waddling is, is a word that I think I could happily use, or perhaps happily use, to describe Griffith's translation that we've seen. But Oberman's translations are really beautiful. They're really rhythmic, both of them. They're really neat. I'm not sure that the, the, um, 
the words and the articulation of his pieces have that sense of confusion within them in quite that way. And we're going to consider this a little more. Um, and we're going to consider it in part through a quick look at my attempt with my brief, brief manuscript, which was in part, the second part of it, an unorthodox translation of Riddle 7. And we're looking at the manuscript as submitted to Versal 12, a Dutch magazine, a Dutch journal. Um, it was published in Versal, but not as submitted. So that's an indication of something that might change, where particularly when you start translating in unorthodox ways. Um, and we'll see a little bit more of that. So here is an excerpt from my translation, and it includes the first three words of Riddle 7 at the top in bold, in large typeface. And then there's this little discrete box, which I can tell you now is a little list, if you like, of um, dictionary definitions that I found for each of the words in that first line. And I ordered them so that they would um, um, sound good and look good in that little verse. And then the next discrete verse pushed a little further along across the page um, are excerpts from different translators of Riddle 7 of that phrase. So I took the phrases from each of those translations and again I ordered them so that it, 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 it sounds quite good, it's not too, too repetitive, or the repetitions work poetically in that little stanza. And then the very last smaller typeface, piece of typeface, is my own translation, which is my coat makes no sound, coupled with two possible alternatives that I considered. And this is an excerpt from my translation of Riddle 7. But as with, as, as with my remarks on Oberman's piece, I don't think this is confused enough. I don't think it waddles enough. It's too neat. And indeed, those changes in size and boldness of typeface, and in fact, when it was published in Versal, they changed it to instead of size of typeface, they were working with different shades of grey. Um, it indicates a kind of hierarchy that we start off with the old English, then we go to the dictionary, then we go to the translations, and then suddenly, there you are, um, you've got the new one. And it isn't like that. The process is much more confused as well. So how to work with that? Um, here is um, a second version that I made um, where I took the same, a part of the same poem and um, some of my notes, including little red bits that I had in it, and I displayed them across a page in different ways, in different directions, in different orders, and you can see that there is no obvious place to begin, which I really like. And also, I assume that anyone who reads this is going to navigate it in different ways. The like eye is going to be pulled into different directions as they read. Um, and I think this is closer to what I was trying to do um, with my previous piece, that confusion, that waddling that I felt is more honest and closer to the experience. Now let's move on to John Porter's Anglo-Saxon riddles, and he tackles fragile material materiality in medieval manuscripts in that he uses spacing to acknowledge the gaps in the wear and tear of the surviving manuscript. And I'm just going to go quickly to, first of all, I think I copied this from um, Craig Williamson's book, um, and you can just see the um, ellipses showing um, the gaps in the original, a sort of attempt to replicate those gaps. Um, I think it's um, Riddle 85 in Williamson's book, but it's Riddle 89 in John Porter's. And here's John Porter's translation, which I think is quite beautiful because it centers on those gaps. The text is surrounding the gaps. We read the gaps and we, we, we decide which bits of text to link them to. He's making what we don't know much, much more um, evident in the poem, which takes it closer to that experience, perhaps, that he might have had with the um, original that he was looking at. And then lastly, um, very quickly, um, I'm going to look at the reflection that can happen in translation that you can include as part of translation. Um, this happens in, in my brief brief, and I'll show you a bit of that, and it happens in Caroline Bergfeld's log in Drift, and I'll show you a bit of that. So first of all, brief brief begins, and this is the beginning of it, with um, different bits of found text from different writers 
on theoretical translation, or indeed I also use dictionary definitions of translation. And it's a bit of a smorgasbord and it's a bit confusing and a bit of a muddle. It's much, although it looks quite neat on the page here, um, it doesn't have that sense of hierarchical order that I fe felt the riddle did. So I'm a lot happier with it um, as a piece. And in Caroline Burkwell's attempts at the seafarer in Drift, she includes both lingual and extralingual renderings of the seafarer. So she's using Old English, Old Norse, she's using her own language, her first language, Norwegian, um, one of her first languages. Um, she uses homophonic translation where she's translating sound, sounds rather than sense. And she includes reflective elements on the process of translation right in the middle of the book drift. So it becomes part of the creative piece. So these words on her process of translating are actually part of the finished work that she presents. By engaging with the source text in a loose homophonic call and response, I can cut away from the less yielding aspects of this transhistoric contact and value the strongly sound led rules of the original. So she's translating and valuing and privileging that very strong sound. Um, and we can see in this next slide, we'll see her bunching together names of birds, adding other names of birds, using local North Sea coast birds um, with homophonic associations and onomatopoeic renderings. In her dearly wonky world, hung albatross, oceans glued in floating tar wings, willing swan song, goose me up, give me outlines, laughing gannets, mully mucks, fulmers, curlews, godwits, show me the wave, powerful arctic birds, in out of the rollers, cranes, golden eagles, shearwaters, pole to pole, long haul navigators, show me the wave. Whoop, gulls, yap, 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 fire birds. And she goes on to begin to play more with stutters and gaps in the original, but also in the subject matter of drift, which is that very difficult, tragic subject of the left to die boat of migrants that were left literally to die in the Mediterranean in 2011. And that forms the core of drift, that the, these other works are kind of drifting around. But this, this loss, as you can see, the repeated letters or the loss of gaps, um, gaps in the letters or loss of letters within a word are part of that sense of I'm approaching a subject that really is, has to remain inarticulate, that we can't talk about. And in fact, in part of the poem, it degenerates into this stutter where language just completely breaks down. So I'm going to end this bit with this wonderful challenge that I found, and I think that all these poets inadvertently perhaps are responding to. Catherine O'Brien O'Keefe says, the challenge is clear. What editorial strategies may we devise to present a multiply attested old English poem in a form which both reflects its existence as a complex of realized texts and represents the subtle visual information contained in its graphic arrays? And it's these poets and the strategies that they use, I think, that respond to that challenge. And just to, to list a few of them, we've got homophonic translation, where you're translating sounds, tactical misrecognition, visual translations, collages, physical translations, images, material, ekphrasis, where you translate um, text perhaps into image. And then there's prismatic translation, um, coined by Matthew Reynolds, where you've got multiple variants in the process of a single translational act. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, and um, we've got Megan on the screen, have we? Or is it still me? It's still you on the screen, but I can stop that. Hold on, okay. um, I'll remove the spotlight. Um, Jenny, do you want to take over and chair the q &A? important unmuting myself before I start talking. Okay. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, it's wonderful to revisit those uh, comments from Miller Oberman again. Um, that really was a, a wonderful talk and, and I feel like I enjoy it even more listening to you talk it through and applying it to other poets and to, and to your own work. Um, one thing that I was thinking of in particular was you know, your forthcoming books about inarticulacy, um, when words don't quite convey things. And you showed us 
um, some stuff in drift about when the stutter and when words don't um, words don't convey information anymore. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what kind of techniques you like for representing that that those those moments when language doesn't articulate anymore. Do you have any particular techniques that you like for that for those moments? I think I think for me, I'm I'm very interested in um, visual um, text. So in using either space or visuals, but usually visuals in the sense of words, but words that you can't read anymore um, to interrupt something that's getting a little bit too neat. Um, so in the example that in the example I put up of Riddle Seven, where you've got all these blocks all over the page um, and you don't know what to read when you because it's not presented as a traditional text, um, it's very likely when you first read it that you either just get drawn to some particular word that speaks to you in, in a particular way, completely out of context of the text within which it sits, or you're looking at it as shapes. And so I'm, I'm really, really interested in that process between viewing text as shapes of black, white, or other colors, um, and, and, and the, the, the shapes that letters form before you read them. And then what happens when you start to read them? And so in my own work, I um, do quite a lot of overlaid text where you get two texts on top of each other, but you can't quite, quite read either, or you have to struggle to read them. Or I might um, remove spacing between um, words and even spacing between letters. So letters are really jumbled together. Um, and another technique that I have often used in the past is if I'm working on a piece, um, once I've got the text that I like, I um, reduce it in word to 50%, 30%, to a, to a stage where I can no longer read the words, I can only see the shapes. And then I work on it again there before I bring it back up again. So yeah, that was rather a long answer, but those are various things that I really like to do. No, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I have other questions, but see other people have started to ask. So. Um, Craig Williamson, would you like to ask a question now? I want to make a comment. Can I do that? Mm, please do. So I was interested in um, uh, the talk about Clifford Geertz in the beginning because when I was first starting to work on the riddles in graduate school, one of my minor fields, much to the dismay of some of my English professors, was linguistic anthropology. So I would come to the seminars with my um, copy, my copy of the, of the old English riddles from the extra book. And everyone else would be reading from their field notes, and I would be reading from my my uh, my manuscript. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was um, there is a technique which I use, which I've explained in a couple of places, which is um, to use a kind of old English technique to try to get at the complications of a particular word. So, in the book Moth Riddle, for example, Moth Award Frat. You know, the word seems to be more orally than written because if you said, if you were talking about written words, you would give away the solution right away. And the verb, fretvon, um, it means to eat or devour, but it actually is a kind of uh, um, savage, destructive way of, of, of destroying something. So my solution to that problem was to say, in the translation, a moth ate songs, wolfed words. And by doing that, I've used the old English um, pattern of, um, of syntactic repetition with semantic variation. So, and I do that constantly in the, in the translations where I feel like it's very difficult to get with a single modern English word, what's going on in the old English word. And that, that's something that you can use to your advantage. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So you're, 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 you're developing the, and it's so specific to the translation as well. So you're developing an old English technique to help you with bringing it into the modern world. And you're also bringing in that technique as you do it. Yeah. There are a few uh, comments and questions in the chat. Jenny, would you like me to read those out? 
give you a break. Okay, awesome. Uh, from Katia, first of all, a, a comment um, about the concept of confusion as strength and how interesting that is and how much food for thought it um, brings up. And I completely agree. Do you want to comment back on that at all, Judy? Um, yeah, Katia, I, I know Katia well. And yes, I think I think it was so liberating in the field of anthropology. And as, as Craig has said, with attending these linguistic anthropology lecture, lectures, I think this, this anthropology and poetry have so much in common. Um, and it's, it, I, 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 once I discovered this and I began to kind of um, translate Geertz's concept to the world of translation and also the world of poetic creativity, I found so many ways in which it's been helpful. So I do encourage you to, to explore it further. And then another one in the chat uh, from Leslie, in case you want to follow along. Judy, I'll read it out for everyone. Um, at what point do you describe what you're doing as original, quote unquote, creativity from uh, a translation, quote unquote? That is you as an original poet slash creative writer, as opposed to a scholar who translates. OK, thank you. I'm I, not a scholar. Can I just interject? I'm really curious. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm really curious because you gave us the unstill ones, but I was thinking in terms of, um, of Ezra Pound's The Seafarer and then the example you gave, they were such different versions that they seem mm. that they are those authors' works. They may have been inspired by this original poem, but we now see Ezra Pound as that original poet. That, that was what I was, in terms of what I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I don't think there's a clear border between the two. Um, translation is, is a wonderful word that you can use really quite loosely. And creative poetry can include found texts that have been completely written by someone else, or as you said, diff different kinds of translation that are looser or much closer to the original. But although some of these translators might argue their text is close to the original, it's just not in the way you're accustomed to make it. So I think the border is very porous between the two. Um, for me personally, um, I think of myself as a creative translator, um, I would say. So that, um, I mean, I am, a, I am a poet as well, that, that does not translate at times, but when I'm working with the riddles, I think of it as creative translation. So I'm acknowledging that source and I'm working with it in different ways. Um, I'm aware of it. That source has a presence within my poem that is really quite strong, but it's a good question. Other folks, please do feel free to raise your hands or add more in the chat. I'll keep working through the chat. Um, we've got a question from Judith. Um, and can, asking, can you talk about the relationship between formal complexity and difficult subjects? Would you apply the full armory of abstracting devices anywhere in a poem, or is there a mimetic relationship between trauma in the meaning and fracture uh, of, in the form? Right, um, I don't think um, um, diff difficult, difficult, I'm just trying to work my way through your question. I think difficult is, has got several meanings here. So there's difficult in terms of being complex and hard to untangle um, and possibly obscure if you can't untangle it. But there's difficult in terms of being in, um, having an emotional cost um, if you articulate it, which is certainly what I was referring to in terms of the um, left to die boat. Um, they don't necessarily work together, but I think that um, in terms of a difficult subject such as traumatic or emotionally costly in some way, um, we need to, it, it's uncomfortable if it becomes too easily and in an unthought way, to, well, that, that phrase I use, too domesticated when you write about it. That, that I, I, I feel that there needs to be some sort of acknowledgement in some way, which doesn't have to be complexly difficult. It could be something very simple, but there needs to be some kind of acknowledgement that this is an area in, in which I tread with caution and respect and awareness. So I think that's where I would go with that. Um, certainly 
in terms of there being a sense of, if it's trauma, I would expect in some way for there to be some kind of fracture. I would be quite disturbed if there wasn't, unless of course that was the intention to disturb by making something very smoothly um, articulate. Um, so, but, but that goes back to what I just said, that I think it's just having that awareness and looking at looking at a way of acknowledging it in your writing is what's important. So actually Caroline Bergville, who was the last poet that I put up there, she's very much a performance poet and Drift was originally a performance installation. And in fact, the quotations that I was taking are, are a kind of a post post installation publication of the text, which is actually different from the performance. So that's that's quite per, that's quite a pertinent question. I tend not to perform texts. So I guess I'm I am particularly interested in visual replications. Um, but I do think that in performance, as you say, it's you you've got this you've got this extra dimension in a way in that not only is no performance the same, but we can't freeze frame it. We can't as readers stop at one point and decide to look at that. Um, it, it's, it's moving on, on, on all the time. And that's certainly something that you can play with very much, I think, as a performer and as a creator of something intended to be performed. It's not, it's not where I've taken my texts recently. And when I think of work that I've designed to be um, installed, for example, in an outdoor space where it's performed upon, perhaps, because it might be rained on, it might blow down, or I suppose if it's there for a very long time, moss might grow on it. I, I delight in those changes, but um, I haven't gone into um, oral performance myself, but that's not to say it's, it's, it's a huge, huge area and, and very, very productive, I agree. Just going to have a go at this this long question here from Jack Hartley, which is something that I was thinking about as well. It is it's actually not a hundred miles away from what you've just been talking about, and this is the the, the sort of flip side of um, not wanting your translation to be too neat and tidy, but also to acknowledge that the original text is not necessarily neat and tidy. Not just that it has holes in it, but that it's the it's the outcome of a long process perhaps starting in an oral text and being uh, and evolving over time. I think, I've, I hope I've got most of the, the nuance from the original question. Um, and Jack Hartley was suggesting that, um, well, perhaps he's asking, perhaps, is there a way to, to bring that kind of process into the translation itself? And uh, something I was wondering as well is, 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 there, is there a way in your translation to reflect on the process that led to the original that you're then trying to translate. I hope I've got everything in there. Yeah, I'm trying to read it as well. Um, yes. You're not, it's not simply a translation of a thing, but but that the the original is a witness to mm -hmm. an evolving story yeah. over time. Yeah, so that in fact there is no beginning, just as I'm 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 suggesting that there might be no end. Um, there is no beginning, there is no seed. And I think, I think you're right, Jack. And I think you're right to pick a hole in what I've been saying um, from that. Um, and certainly if we, took, if we took this into the realm of poetry, if I was talking about my own poetry, I think that's absolutely true that the poem that you create itself comes from somewhere. It's, 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 it's a response. Um, and I think you can extrapolate that onto translation and the source material, and particularly because we're thinking of manuscripts then being um, um, coming out of oral source and oral source coming out of whatever came before. Um, I think that's true. Um, and I'm, 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 think, I'm thinking it through now, and I'm thinking maybe with Griffiths, um, that also makes his work very interesting where he's pointing back to um, a source that's going to change as we learn more about it, that, that, that really nothing is fixed. Um, and, and, and our act of writing things down, translating them or writing them down or creating them or forming pieces is an attempt to fix things 
which we're always trying to do as human beings. But but it's an, it's 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 doomed, not doomed to failure, but um, it's it's always going to be um, improved upon or changed as 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 everything changes. Yeah. Well, so, that's not a failure. That's an ongoing process, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's not a failure. That's right. There's another question in the chat, but I'll just turn to, to Laura now, if you'd like to ask your question, you've got your hand up. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Judy, for a really um, interesting um, talk. What I wanted to ask you about, and this is partly coming out of um, my teaching involved English, and I've been doing some of my own um, translations of the riddles, just what you thought about um, the riddles as a genre, because obviously in the Exeter book, they don't come with the answers. Um, but, you know, if we have a, an edition of the text, we've got the, you know, we could look in the back of the book and we can see the answers. How do you um, approach the relationship, I suppose, between the supposed answer to a riddle and the text? And obviously so many of them, you know, the answers are contested or there are some that are so full of gaps that we just don't really know what it might be. So are you in some ways drawn to the riddles that are more ambiguous? Um, or how do you deal with the ones where there is a kind of agreed upon answer? It's something I'm sort of really interested in, in terms of the sort of reading process of yeah. encountering a riddle. Well, it was what drew me to them in the first place. And it was what um, really led me to start translating them and then to continue was that I felt through that forensic process of translation where, I mean, it, it's probably imaginary, but I really feel like I'm beginning to understand the poet who wrote this or created this, I feel closer to that person. And so I also begin to feel like I'm understanding the poem from the inside a little more and that the solutions, sometimes the solutions that are suggested and, and maybe are agreed upon by scholars and for very good reasons, and they know a lot more than I do, feel wrong because of that um, experience of inhabiting the process of creating the poem in another language and sometimes I come up with another solution or indeed an idea for what it could be as a result of that and I find that with the, translating the riddles the most exciting thing the most most exciting part of doing so um, and it may all be an imaginary kind of indulgence of mine that I've created I've fabricated this original poet um, who is really just another version of me perhaps, but, but I do find that very, very interesting. And, um, you know, who are we to know what, what the solutions are? And, and there may be others, and maybe there's more than one, maybe it's intended to have more than one. I love that, that sounds good to me. Um, unfortunately, we are one minute past our advertised time, and I feel very sad about that because, um, I like to be on time. And I'm also very sad because we had a really lovely question um, from James and from Francesca to suggest um, teaching techniques for, for students in Advent gardens. What should I do, Megan? Should, should I? Should Let's I... take, if, if you're happy, Judy and Jenny and folks who are here, please feel free to hop away, but we are still recording, so you can always revisit this. Um, but shall we take that question if you're happy to, and then we'll thank our speaker and end. Can you ask the question again? Yes. Uh, the question. The, yeah, I'll ask the question again. The question was from from James Paz and and Francesca Alfrey, who said that that they want their students to use avant garde translation techniques in their classrooms, and so they wanted to know if there were any particular exercises or techniques um, that you would recommend for getting them started on this process. Wow. Um, I think I think there needs to be a book on this. <laughs> I don't think there is at the moment. So. Um, a good one is homoph homophonic translations. Um, it's an ulipo technique. I'm going to write that in the chat in case it's there in the chat if people want to look it up. It's an ulipo technique. Um, and what, what it means is you translate the word into what it sounds like. Um, it's close sound in, in, in English which may have nothing to do with its original meaning at all. And you can come up with some really fun and quirky um, and very different translations. And if you set a whole class to do a homophonic translation of the riddles, or maybe of several different poems from different ages, perhaps, you'll find that each person will, will create a different translation because we all, we, all have, we all hear things slightly differently and they may use different registers and different 
different um, phrasing. And that can be a really fun way to start um, to just throw it. So you're throwing away the meaning essentially completely and you're just working with the sound of the poem. But it's also really good at, at getting you close to it, its rhythm and it, its texture, which is also a lovely thing to do. That's fascinating. Uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. I was just thinking about the example that Craig Williamson mentioned about the um, the moth um, ward frat. And then if we started with frat, which we don't use in modern English anymore, um, where would we go with that? I, I was thinking about fret, I was thinking about fret work, I was thinking about interlace. I can just imagine how exciting a classroom would be with, mm -hmm. uh, with that kind of technique. Um, but now I'm using up time that we don't have anymore. So thank you so much, Judy. That was so stimulating, so interesting. And thank you so much for starting off this conversation in such a lovely, a lovely conversational way. So could I ask everyone if, um, if you would like uh, to put your cameras on or turn your sound on and um, give a, rounding, a, a rousing round of applause for our, our speaker, Judy Kendall. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.